Welcome to the Lasting Love Connection Podcast, your leading resource for relationship tips, insights, and interviews. On today's show, we're going to have Dr. Gay Hendricks. He's going to talk to us about how do we have deeper communication, more intimacy, full authenticity and transparency, and a relationship that's full of honesty and positivity. Gay Hendricks has been married for nearly 35 years has been on Oprah nearly a handful of times. He's written over 10 books, and he's seriously one of my favorite authors and speakers out there on the subject of relationships. I think you're really going to love it. So, let's welcome Gay Hendricks on the show. Gay, let's start off with a question. What is the minute truth, and how can we begin to use it to have deeper and more honest communication? Yes, well, a long time ago, when I first started coming up with the ideas in Conscious Loving, at the time they had just come out with the gigantic new um, electron microscope. Hmm. This is back like 30 years ago. And it allowed you to see things in a detail that you couldn't see before. And so I realized that what we were really talking about was a form of microscopic truth, where if you look through the microscope Hmm. at an angry person, you might just see the outside, you know, but if you look through a microscope about what was going on, you could see that underneath that angry person was actually a person who was scared and a person who might have some sadness. And so the more you look deeper into the microscope, the more you found the real truth of the situation and particularly the truth that nobody can argue about. Um, You know, because if I say to you, if I get angry and I say, you really make me mad. <laughs> well, it's sort of the truth, but it's also not really the truth because you could argue about it, you know? Right. And it also locates the source of the problem over in you. Mm. You know, so it has a problem built into it. So I'm giving all my power away to you the moment I say, you really piss me off. Uh, and so uh, what you have to do is go inside that and go microscopic and say, oh, I'm scared, or I felt hurt by what you did. Hmm. Um, But as long as you stay at that arguable level, then you can never resolve anything. But if you go down to the more microscopic level to what's really going on inside the person, then you find a way to resolve things. Because I've been in many, many situations, hundreds of situations where both people were angry at each other, but then they dropped down and said what they were afraid of or what they were hurt about. They got down a little further in their bodies and owned what they were really scared about, for example, and the problem dissolved just like that. You know, wow. it was, um, so it's kind of a miraculous sort of thing when you really learn how to communicate from what's really authentic and, uh, and deep inside you and particularly what's unarguable. If you can find something to say that nobody can argue with, you know, like the moment you say, I'm scared right now. Nobody argues with that. Right, because that's, that's your own experience, and you know it so intimately. And in contrast, if I say, you're a jerk, well, you could always say, well, I'm not. You know, I'm, you're I'm, the jerk. You know, right, you get, exactly. Yeah. Then you are, and we can start yeah. arguing about it. One of the biggest points that I got from that, and I, I really love this concept of the microscopic, microscopic truth and really delving into yourself when you're feeling something, one of the things that she really talked about is like feeling it in your own body and then giving a name to it. Yes. Well, right after Conscious Loving, the publisher came back to me and they said, you know, Conscious Loving was a big hit. What would you like to write next? And I said, well, there's only one book. If I, gotta write only one, if I can write only one more book, I'm going to write a book about body-centered transformation. Mm. And so the book that came right after Conscious Loving was called At the Speed of Life. And you can still get it, uh, although it never was as very popular as Conscious Loving was. Um, Conscious Loving has been basically in the bookshelves, on the bookshelves for the last 20 years. And recently we got a great uh, thing from uh, Gwyneth Paltrow because she recommended the book in her blog. Mm. And it suddenly put it back at the top of the bestseller list after 20 years. And so Mm. if you're listening out there, Gwyneth, thank you very much. the uh, book we wrote right after Conscious Loving, though, is called At the Speed of Life, and it's all about body-centered transformation. And one of the things that's in that book is about how to experience things somatically in your body so that you don't keep carrying them around. You know, like, have you ever had the experience of 
sort of obsessively thinking about some situation. Yeah. Uh, well, I found out how to turn that off because I used to have that a lot. And it was the moment I would drop down and experience something in my body. Like I remember once coming back from a meeting. This was in the 1970s. And I'd had an angry meeting with the dean of the university that I worked at at the time. I was a professor at the University of Colorado. And so I had a conflict with the dean. He was a very by the books kind of guy. And I was sort of always wanted to do things a different way. And so we were always clashing with each other. And one day I was driving home after one of our clashes and I was recycling the conversation in my mind. And I was coming out with, I don't know if you've ever done this, but you replay an argument and come out with a better set of things you could say to that <laughs> argument. That's right. You know? You're building up <laughs> ammo yeah. afterwards. Yeah. Like, oh, yeah. if I would have said that. Exactly. <laughs> you hit them with zingers, you know, one-liners that <laughs> make, I see make them, them next go. time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it's usually about 30 minutes later. You know, yeah, time. or the next day. Yeah. So I was thinking about all these zingers I could have zinged him with on the way home. And um, I realized suddenly, wait a minute. That's in the past. There's absolutely nothing that can be done about that moment. Hmm. What's present, and I realized what was present is I still felt angry down in my body. And so I dropped down and I let myself experience it. As a matter of fact, I was driving home and I stopped at a traffic light and I was feeling this anger. And I started making these angry sounds. I was just going, rah, rah, you know, expressing <laughs> as much as I could. And I forgot that the windows were open and there was a guy in a pickup truck that had pulled up next to me at the traffic light. And I looked up and he was looking down at me like I was crazy, you know, because I was like, Rah! <laughs> That's what and, uh, I was thinking too. <laughs> so, uh, but as I drove on home, I realized that underneath that anger, I was actually sad. Right. So underneath this level of anger was this whole level of, sadness and I realized in that moment that it didn't have anything to do with the dean that my dramas with the dean were based on feeling sad about not having had a father growing up and wanting a father figure and he, and feeling like this dean was sort of like a father figure but was turning out to be not a good father figure mm -hmm. and so it had to do with an old sadness of mine that was driving this conflict with the dean you know 30 years later right. and uh, in my adult life now, I would have never got to know that unless I'd given myself that moment of body awareness that allowed me to feel that inside myself. Mm -hmm. And so that's why, you know, what you're talking about is learning how to feel things somatically, learning how to really experience it. It's what we call now kinesthetic intelligence. Mm -hmm. And it's just like cognitive intelligence and emotional intelligence. It's a new form of intelligence that we're learning how to use. Mm -hmm. So it's really getting in touch with your body and you know one of the things that actually really came up for me while you were talking is in relationships a lot of fears come up you know and I actually am thinking of uh, clients that I work with a couple that have had many issues of infidelity and the amount of distrust that they have and I can think of the gentleman telling me you know I really don't trust her the names that he gives to her and just a lot of negative energy going out to her and how he really distrusts her, almost hates her, but then just still really loves her. And then her not trusting him in this dynamic. And I'm wondering, how could a couple like this begin to use this kinesthetic or somatic intelligence to communicate with each other, to one, really get honest with each other and really open up their hearts to each other? Yes. Well, the way to do that is to find the feeling inside where they're connected. Hmm. And I'll give you an example of what I mean. A lot of times when a couple is fighting on the surface, they've been fighting about the same thing for a lot of times. I've had couples in here, one I mentioned in a book, that had been having the same argument for 29 years. <laughs> They they started having this particular argument on their honeymoon, actually, mm -hmm. and they were still having it 29 years later, and it was happening right in front of me. Mm -hmm. And so this is my first session with them. But here's the amazing thing that happened. In that session, we figured out what they were angry about, but then we dropped underneath it and found out what they were scared about. 
And the thing was, they were both afraid of abandonment, but neither one of them knew that. But once they started talking about their deeper feelings, they realized, and this is so true for many people, that there's a deeper connected feeling that both people are concerned about early childhood abandonment, for example, Mm -hmm. and are duking it out on the surface, but they really need to get down into that old stuff that's really driving the situation. Mm. I, you know, as you're talking, I'm really thinking a lot about, you know, several things. One is how emotions or arguments in the work that I do with couples, when I hear couples talking about something superficially, sometimes I'll interject and say, you know, while you guys are talking about an issue with a house or payments that you're making, I'm also wondering what's underneath that. And in my work, I've learned Almost, it's almost like a part of me doesn't listen so much to the details of what they're talking about, but more to the feelings that they're, mm-hmm. you know, sharing with each other. And I and I get them to try to really speak in this language feeling. And one of the things you're really touching on for me is how there's kind of different levels of emotions. You know, there's the levels of God, you're a jerk, kind of the first one, and then. You know, I'm really angry, getting a little bit more personal, and then, you know, I'm worried that maybe I won't be loved. And then underneath that, at least so far, is the impact of childhood and how these childhood dramas play out in relationships in our adulthood. Exactly. And a lot of times, too, um, the, uh, the issues are not just with parents, but a lot of times come out of brother and sister Mm. dynamics. Mm. Um, You know, a lot of times, like for example, people hold themselves back for from expressing their full potential in the world because they're afraid of outshining one of their brothers and sisters. Mm. Or they maybe were born in such a way that they feel like a burden, and so they don't express their full potential because they're afraid that that would just be presenting more of a burden in the world. Mm. And so there's all sorts of early stuff that we kind of drag along with us. But the nice thing about it is once you shine the light of awareness on it, you realize it doesn't have to bother you anymore. You know, mm-hmm. you don't need to stay attached to it. You can develop a whole new um, way of being. Right. You know, like Katie and I, we changed our whole financial thing in our relationship. Basically, in one moment, we both realized that we came from these backgrounds, both of us having been raised by parents who had gone through the Great Depression and the Second World War. We had developed this sense of scarcity in mm-hmm. us that it was always just about getting by, you know, about having enough to get by. And we realized one day in our 30s, we realized, wait a minute, that was then, this is now. Our job is to open up to doing what we love to do and and expressing as much of our potential as we can and manifesting as much abundance as we want. Mm -hmm. And so right away, we turned our financial life around. Within the next year or two, we had completely you know, kind of redone our finances to the extent that we had plenty of money then to do what we wanted to do, and we manifested more money, and so it was getting on the same wavelength with each other rather than operating out of that old sense of scarcity. And what I'm hearing from you, too, is the importance of acknowledging maybe some of the lineage that you come from, acknowledging some of that history, and then kind of taking ownership of, okay, this is, you know, how I've maybe integrated into my life but I have a decision and I can make a choice to have something different if I would like to. Yeah, that's really important. You know, like me, for example, um, since we're doing this on video, I can show you. Uh, like right now, for example, I weigh about 180 pounds <laughs> and I'm about six feet tall. Right. There, when I was in my 20s, I was exactly the same height, but I weighed 320 pounds. Wow. So I weighed 140 pounds more than I weigh now. And I was very obese as a child. Um I was obese as a teenager. It was something going on, you know, in my glands and stuff like that because I was the only fat person in a family where everybody else was thin. So I ate Mm. the same food as thin people ate, but I gained weight. Mm. So later on, I kind of had a moment of enlightenment in my 20s where I realized that I was trying to replay my father's life, basically. And he died at age 32, very obese. And Mm. at the time, I smoked heavily also. And so I realized I was kind of trying to replay his life in a way. And 
suddenly I woke up and realized, wait a minute, I want to have my own life. And so I really reinvented my own body consciously. I decided what I wanted to weigh, and then I just started eating foods that fed my spirit rather than fed my whole programmed body. And so within a year or so, I'd lost over 100 pounds. And so I teach that now. I mean, we have a weight loss program um, that makes use of that particular set of consciousness tools. The reason I mention that, though, is because even something as physical as a body can be retransformed through an act of consciousness. But it's act of consciousness that needs to be followed up then by practical activities in the real world. Right. You know, the day after I had this enlightenment experience, I had to have breakfast, you know, so I had to find <laughs> something that, to eat for breakfast. And right. that I remember going through everything I could possibly find in the refrigerator, and I only found one thing that tasted good, and that was some blueberries. And so that was what I ate that day, you know, and, and I gradually, over the next 30 days, I lost 30 pounds, a pound a day, by only doing one thing, which was eating foods that felt like they fed my spirit rather than the foods that I'd eaten before that made me fat. Mm. And so within the year, I'd reinvented myself and quit the smoking and gotten out of a toxic relationship I was in at the time and really kind of rebirthed my whole conscious life came out of that moment. And so I also became one of those rare medical um, miracles. Only about 2% of people lose a lot of weight, like 100 pounds, and then don't gain it back. That's right. and so I, I became one of those 2%. <clears throat> and uh, to this day, I get uh, scientists contacting me, wanting to interview me about how I did it, you know, because apparently that's a fairly rare thing to do. So, um, but I wanted to let you know that if it's a, an emotional thing or a personality thing or even a body thing, it's really all about coming up with a new set of commitments for how your life wants to be. Like for me, my big commitment that helped me lose that hundred and some pounds was I made a commitment to wanting to feel my spiritual aspect of myself in every moment. I, I wanted to be able to feel, you know, a lot of people talk about God and religion and that kind of thing, and that never really interested me. I really wanted to feel spirituality in my body. That's you know, right. I, don't, I don't like to argue about theology or which religion is best or anything like that. I say that it's really about learning how to feel spiritual, not talk spiritual, mm. you know. And so that's a really important distinction because I think if we all felt our spirituality, we could get rid of all the wars in the world. And, you know, but as long as we keep fighting about who's right and who's wrong, we're going to stay at war just like we have been at war for thousands of years. And so I want to take responsibility for creating peace on earth, and I want to invite everybody else to do that too, by dropping into a type of spirituality inside that doesn't have anything arguable about it, unarguable spirituality. You can't say one religion is right and another religion is wrong. I mean, that defeats the purpose of religion, because if you fight about religion, it's just as bad as fighting over apples or fighting over real estate or fighting over gold. You know, it's just the same thing we've always done. So we want to create a new form of spirituality in ourselves that creates peace, not creates war. And it's it's so fantastic what you're saying about creating it in yourself. And I'm also 100% with you that as far as God goes or source, divine, you feel it in your body. And I actually have your quote from your book, Five Wishes, on my phone so that every oh. time I pick up my phone, I read that. <laughs> and Wonderful. And it helps, you know. It helps to have those little reminders to keep me focused. A phone is something that I check, you know, I don't know, 30, 40 times in a day. So every time I see that, thank you. And sometimes I don't consciously acknowledge it, but just the fact that it's there, my mind is picking it up. What I love what you're saying, too, is that source or divinity is something that we can honestly we can feel in our bodies and I know that because like when I pet my dog for example I feel a sense of love when I hold the baby you feel it it's just this kind of relaxation in your body I'm thinking about the work that I do with couples or even in myself that sometimes when I get triggered a part of me kind of tenses up and wants to fight back 
you know, to argue back or be right. What yeah. are what are some keys that you found that really help couples interrupt that pattern? Because like you're saying, doing it once, you can do it, right? I can wake up and decide oh, I'm going to eat a healthy breakfast or I'm going to be in session, counseling session, and I'm going to be honest. And then I get out of that session and something comes up because we are triggered. I mean, they, we have patterns. What are some ways that people can kind of rewire those patterns or begin to have a conscious practice of every day the simplest i like to start with the simplest things the most important simple kind of 30 second approach is to take three easy breaths and change your body position Mm. so like right now one easy breath two easy breaths Then consciously change your body position. Maybe consciously stretch or move around a little bit. Just move your body position. Yes. Here's why that's important. The fight or flight reflex in human beings causes you to freeze your body position. It causes your muscles to tighten. It causes your vision to go tunnel vision rather than wide vision. That's the nature of the fight or flight response. And what you're talking about, that needing to be right is exactly the same energy that's in a cat or a dog when their hackles go up on their back of their neck. (laughs) We have exactly the same mechanism in us. We just have, most of us have less hair on the back of our (laughs) neck. And so we don't get that hair that stands up quite as much. Um, Except for my cousin Vinny from the Bronx. He has that (laughs) much hair. (laughs) Um, So... um, We have exactly the same wiring in us that causes that same hackles response in cats, dogs, other organisms. It's the same thing that causes a shrimp to curl up. Mm. And, and it is that organisms at this stage of evolution on planet Earth have learned to contract when we're under stress. Mm. We've learned to curl up toward the middle. And in the, in the human being, what that relates to is clutching the belly. <gasps> you tighten your belly muscles and push your breath up into your chest. Right. And that's kind of the fight or flight response. But it involves a complicated set of things that freezes the muscles and freezes the eyes looking straight ahead and causes the shoulders to rise up. And all of those things are part of the fight or flight reflex. Now, what we have to do at this next stage of evolution, in my opinion, for human beings, we need to, instead of contracting when we get under stress, we need to expand under stress in Mm. the sense of, hmm, what are the possibilities here? Hmm, we need to go toward wonder rather than toward fear. Hmm. That will be the move that evolves us through this current stuck space we're in as human beings, where we go for contraction when we're under stress. Hmm. So we want to go to another, we want to build a new possibility in now for the next few hundred thousand years of evolution. And it needs to start here with you and me and everybody that's watching this uh, conversation. So go ahead, go ahead. Yeah. So what I'd like everybody to do is under stress, next time you get under stress, notice that you're contracting and instead expand around that. Just give your nervous system a brand new possibility. So find the very thing that's making you contract and expand into it instead. That will build up a new set of kind of what I call evolutionary muscles. Uh, it builds up a new set of evolutionary possibilities in your, inside yourself. See, here's the thing, Luis, is that human beings have lots of nerve endings and places on our body to register pain, right? Right, right. We've got all sorts of receptors. All sorts of, like, look in the bottom of your foot, for example, how many pain receptors there are on the bottom of their foot. Hmm. Now, in evolution... Why would that be? Well, human beings have been walking around without shoes for hundreds of thousands of years, so it's of our advantage to know what we're stepping on sharp. Human beings have made a 
bajillion mistakes about where they've stuck their foot over the past <laughs> few million years. <laughs> and so we've got plenty of nerve endings for that. But where are our all over spiritual body bliss receptors? You know, where can you touch your body and immediately feel spiritual bliss? Well, that's not as easy to find. Right. You can find maybe sexual bliss in a couple of areas, very small areas of the body. But what I'm looking for is creating a new type of nervous system that thrives on positive energy, that doesn't mm. need to create cycles of pain mm. in our lives. And if one person can do it, it's possible. So I've trained my life, turned my life to finding out how to exist in a state of positive energy for longer and longer periods of time. So, for example, in my marriage, that was the first place I applied it. Katie and I haven't said a critical word to each other in probably close to 15 years wow. since we, we put our attention on eliminating blame and criticism mm. back in the 80s when we'd been together just a few years. And it took us several years to make good on that. But I haven't missed it a bit. You know, mm -hmm. I don't miss being criticized. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure Katie doesn't miss me criticizing her. Um, I, love, I love what yeah. you said, too, about the criticism and blame, because in the work that I did uh, teaching the a modified version of the John, Dr. John Gottman curriculum, he calls the four horsemen of apocalypse. Criticism and blame are two of them. And, you know, the four horsemen in the Bible is their coming and it's the end of the world. Similarly, in a relationship, criticism and blame, these are strong foreshadows of a lot of damage and possible divorce or relationship breakup through those. Just those two are so harmful and they're really, they can be very difficult to, to change. And I love what you're saying about opening up and asking yourself, what are the possibilities when you're feeling yourself tighten up? It's so counterintuitive, though. Well, it is counterintuitive because human beings for ages have been laboring under a tremendous delusion, a tremendous uh, misunderstanding. And that is, a lot of human beings think that if they criticize someone long enough, the person will change. <laughs> and, uh, and Or if we criticize ourselves long enough, we'll change. But it's completely missing the point because nobody changes because of criticism. You change because of accurate feedback, maybe, and attention to detail and that kind of thing, but you never thrive on criticism. Criticism is an addiction. Blame is an addiction. Mm -hmm. It's an addiction that produces a specific chemical response, which is a little burst of glee and, and adrenaline. You know, at the moment of, ha, you're wrong and I'm right, you get a burst of adrenaline and glee right. in there. And a lot of people think that's what life is all about. Um, it's, you know, the same reason we learn to eat chocolate bars rather than organic apples. You know, the moment of biting down on that chocolate bar, <laughs> you know, it really right. feels, tastes good. And same thing with that moment of really blaming, you know. I know, Luis, what you've done and you're responsible for all my misery. If you would just quit doing what you're doing, everything would be okay. You know, it's sort of like a satisfying moment when you really blame somebody else. But unfortunately, the drug only lasts about two seconds, and then you have to do it again and mm. again and again. And so it's an addiction that can be withdrawn from, but it takes a lot of attention, and it particularly takes a new commitment, just coming like a Alcoholics Anonymous. Uh, Anonymous. I was going to say Alcoholics Unanimous. <laughs> <laughs> Alcoholics Anonymous commitment to not criticize this day. Mm. It's interesting you're saying, too, that it's an addiction and that we do get a little bit of a spike of um, hormones that kind of make us feel happy. I actually recently interviewed Paul J. Zach, who's done a lot of work on oxytocin and dopamine, and he found that you, that when people you know do something kind of mean or aggressive, there is a little bit of release of dopamine, which is shown to make people feel good, but it doesn't last for very long, and it does have some you know hard effects on the body. And so it's kind of like that cycle of aggression or, you know, blaming or criticism only gives you a very small temporary high. And what you're talking about is a lasting high that you can consciously tune into and feeds a circle of bliss to yourself and others. That's exactly right. And, and a lot of us need to know that we ourselves 
are where bliss comes from. Mm. You know, that, that the source of it is within us. It's not something that's going to come from outside. Um, it's brewed inside by learning how to pay attention to what's real inside yourself. You see, human beings have three levels of reality that we can be in touch with at all times. One is the very physical level. You know, you can feel that. But then there's the energy level inside where all our emotions and our vibrations and, you know, pulsations and all of the energetics of the inner, inner sides of us. But the third level is really new territory for many people. And that's the level of space inside mm. ourselves. And we can only get to that sense of inner space and ease by allowing ourselves to know what our true feelings are and learning how to feel our sadness, learning how to feel our fear, learning how to feel our joy, learning how to feel everything inside so that you expand through all of your feelings and allow all of them to rest in space, in the space that's inside of you. Because if you're closed down to any particular feeling, then that starts to rattle into your outer life. Like if you're closed to the experience of sadness, maybe you've been hurt a long time ago, your body cries out to be released from that, and so it will pull one thing into the other into your life that makes you sad until you realize, wait a minute, I'm where this intention is coming from. I'm who's pulling all of these people into my life that make me sad. And so mm. then you take responsibility for that and open up that and say, oh, okay, I see where that sadness comes from, but now I don't want to live my life out of that anymore. Let me put my attention on how to create more love and positive energy in my life. It's, it's kind of uh, what, I, what I heard from you really reminded me of an art class that I took and the teacher talking about art theory in that there used to be a philosophy that basically the world kind of came at you and the artist viewed their objects as it's coming at them. And then there was a new theory that came in that actually you are the one that's projecting the world out and that changed the way that artists did their artwork and in science you know there is a lot of research been done on that too that we're actually projecting the world and giving it meaning and yes. that's that's really what i'm getting from you it's really true one of my favorite stories is from apparently a true story from the artist picasso i remember um i appreciate you bringing up that whole thing of art there because uh, apparently, Picasso was at a party one time in Paris where there were a lot of famous art critics and art collectors and that kind of thing. And there was this one critic that was kind of haranguing Picasso about that very point that you were just making. See, Picasso was from that movement where they took things inside and then painted what they saw inside, you know, where you have a, a woman with her head on upside down or, you know, all these kind of crazy figures. And so uh, this art critic was, he hated that kind of art. And he was saying to Picasso, he was saying, you know, ultimately photography is the only art because photography really shows us how things are. Hmm. And, and Picasso said, no, I think art is about taking things inside and then painting how you see them. And the guy says, no, you know, he pulls out his wallet and he gets out a picture of his wife. The critic says, and he says, see, now this is what my wife actually looks like. <laughs> and Picasso looked at the photograph and said, she's small, isn't she? <laughs> because it's a small <laughs> picture, right? Yeah. Right. It's never really the real thing itself anyways. Exactly. You know, right. and uh, so I love that story because, you know, it's like, oh, you know, it's a moment of shifting your awareness where you're trapped inside a certain way of seeing the world and then, oh, that's not the way it actually is. So in a way, we all get trapped inside the kind of the mirror, um, what's that thing called, a funhouse, you know, where you go into it and there's a whole bunch of mirrors. Mm. Well, in a way, our own beliefs become an imprisoning funhouse because, and sometimes not so fun either, because you begin to see reflections of that belief everywhere. Mm. And so William James, in um, the middle of the 19th century, William James was the great founder of American psychology, Harvard, etc. And he said, the greatest discovery of our time, middle of the 19th century, is that the 
inner attitudes of our mind affect the outer, atti- outer occurrences of our life. In other words, what you think about inside affects what happens to you. So if you have a belief that the world is dangerous, what's going to happen to you? Well, you're going to attract one experience after the other that confirm that belief. Right. And I bet you've seen that in your own life and your clients' lives a thousand times. Right. And um, I had a client once who came in and she'd had 29 separate car wrecks. Hmm. 29 car accidents. Hmm. And she was in her uh, 50s at this time. So since she learned to drive, she had had almost an accident a year on the average. Wow. And I asked her, what do you make of that? Oh, by the way, she wasn't even, didn't even come in to work on that particular issue. I was just <laughs> asking her about various aspects of her life. And she said that she'd had a recent car accident and it precipitated her coming in to work on some other things because there were these other things in her life that weren't going well. And I said, really? And have you ever had a car accident before? And she said, oh, yeah, yeah, plenty. And I said, plenty? Tell me about that. Turned out she'd had 29 car accidents since her 16th birthday. Wow, that's and a lot. I asked her a lot because you know how many I've had since my 16th birthday because <laughs> I learned to drive. I mean, I got my driver's license literally the day I turned 16. How many accidents have I had since then? Maybe one or two. No. None? Zero. Wow. Hmm. I did have one fellow back into me one time, but I wasn't operating my vehicle at the time. I, was, <laughs> I didn't have much say over the situation so but that was my only encounter with another vehicle so why had she had 29 accidents well i asked her what do you make of that what do you make of the fact that you've had 29 accidents and here's what she said here is the key to it she said well i think what it says is the world's a pretty dangerous place hmm. I said, really is that what it says and i said go a little further she said well life is dangerous hmm. And I said, well, go a little further with that. And she couldn't go any further with it. And I said, well, try on the exact opposite idea. I am dangerous to life. Just say that a few times. I am dangerous to life. And she said, well, what do you mean? I said, you've been in 29 car accidents. When you walk out my door, you're a threat to human civilization. Hmm. And she suddenly realized, oh, she had it backwards. Hmm. I'm an accident waiting to happen. Hmm. I had her play with those ideas of taking responsibility for her accident proneness rather than giving all the power to the universe. Hmm. Okay, so she took back her power. Hmm. Oh, I am an accident waiting to happen. I have an unconscious intention to have accidents. So as she began to open up and mature her awareness about that, I mean, it's a much more mature awareness, isn't it, to say, hmm, how am I creating my reality, rather than saying, it's not my fault, I'm just a helpless prisoner of the universe. Right. You know, that's kind of that wimpy approach to life that's going to get you in trouble. Hmm. They once had a study where they asked prisoners in New York at the uh, big um, prison there, I forget the name of it right now. Sing Sing, uh, they asked, uh, did a study where they asked professional muggers, people that were in prison because they had been busted for mugging. So they had a career of mugging. They showed them pictures of people walking down the street. Mm-hmm. You remember this study? And yeah. they asked them, which one of these people would you mug? And they picked out this certain group of people. And when they analyzed the movements, it was because of their body language. It was they were kind of walking down a street with a big mug me sign Mm -hmm. on their body language. Now, the muggers could spot that. You know, Mm -hmm. you and I might not be able to spot that because we're not professional muggers, but they knew what to look for. We're not drawn to that either. We're not drawn to that, you know. And uh, But the muggers knew what to look for. And they say, oh, it's a person with kind of a, a random, wimpy, unpurposeful way of moving. That's the guy. And, you know, they get all six muggers would say, that's the guy I'd mug right there. You know, Mm. and so it's a way of being in ourselves that attracts things to us. Mm. And so let's not make that wrong. Let's just invite ourselves to wonder, hmm, where are the areas of life where things aren't working? And 
what is it that I need to take responsibility for in order to create things the way I want them in that area? There was one guy they interviewed that had been mugged something like 37 times. They found some guy in Queens, I think, that had been uh, mugged 37 times. And when they interviewed him, you could almost tell why he had been mugged so many times because everything was everybody else's fault. Nothing was his fault. He didn't take responsibility for anything. You know, it was like mm. he's a, a muggy waiting to happen. Just living in a world of worry and fear and blame. I also remember that study or one that was done similar to it where they actually took a group of cops and had them watch a video of these people walking too, and they said, which one of these guys is likely to get mugged? Yeah. And the cops all chose the same people that the muggers chose. There is something really interesting about what you're saying, how we draw, draw experiences, and we, from internally, very much like the root of a tree, we express the physical attributes of whatever it is that we're drawing in. As you were talking, you know, as we've been talking, I'm thinking about some of the own, my own things that I do in my life where I might criticize certain people, and it really made me think about something that a pastor in one of my churches said, is that whenever you point the finger, there's three pointing back, you know, because we <laughs> curl our fingers. And there's a teacher that one time I listened to, and he said, whatever we dislike in another or have a strong aversion to in, in something or someone else, it's something being called up in ourselves to look at. Would you agree with that? I totally agree with that. In fact, um, I don't know if you know this or not, but from 1974 to 95, I was a professor at the University of Colorado. I trained therapists and counselors. Well, that's kind of what I did in my day job. And uh, at night, I wrote books like Conscious Loving, and we went out and appeared on Oprah and all those kinds of things. But my day job at the time, I was a university professor, and I was mainly in charge of training over a 20-year period about 1,200 counselors and therapists. One thing I always used to tell them is that the clients that come in will tell you what you need to work on yourself. Uh, for example, I remember three people in a row coming in back in my 30s, that I had that had father issues they were working on. And sure enough, it was some father stuff in me that was bubbling to the surface and that I needed to work on. So I always used to say to people, pay attention, especially if three clients in a row bring in something, that'll tell you it's, it's not just about them, it's something that's trying to come to your attention too. Mm. And so uh, like one of my uh, uh, women that I get massages from um, – she went to the Boulder College of Massage there in Boulder, which is a very famous massage school. And uh, she said that one thing that they teach them there is that their first thousand massages are for them as a <laughs> practitioner. <Yes. laughs> and, you know, that's why they call it practice, you know, private mm. practice. Is you, mm. you need to practice on yourself as well as on people all the time. Right. It's, it's so interesting that you brought up the massage therapy part because I've talked to massage therapists. At one point, I had a girlfriend who was a massage therapist, and we talked about her work and how when she did massages, stuff would come up for her. It was that she was, you know, she would be massaging someone's leg or uh, an emotional release would come up for her. Mm -hmm. And I think about the work that I do in meeting clients. And, you know, I think of some of the patterns that I'm coming up. I'm actually, lately I've been seeing a lot of couples that have infidelity issues, huge trust issues. And it really makes me think about kind of my own work and the trust uh, stuff that's come up for me. I was actually adopted when I was eight years old. Um, I was homeless for some time. And so, you know, there's a lot of stuff there. And I really love that you said that because it really allows me to sit with my clients and give them a sense of gratitude for bringing that to me. And I love that, too, because it's I'm joining them on the work that we are doing. That's a really great perspective, Luis. See, happiness is not an emotion itself. It's how you feel about all your feelings. And so if you're closed to your feelings, you don't get to feel happy, you know, but you're open to all your feelings, you get to feel happy because that's what happiness is. It's kind of like the, the bubble, the froth around all of your feelings that you get to feel, ah, you know, so it's uh, mm. easy to feel happy even with your anger because happiness is so much bigger than that, you know, mm. it's, 
It's how you feel about all your feelings. Mm. Mm. I think that's what God is, too, is God is all of us at our full level of expansion. Mm. You know, that it's not just one guy with a gray beard who lives off in the northeast somewhere in the sky. You right. Know, that's, that's one version of God, but another version of God is God is all of us or any of us at our full level of expansion, our full occupancy of ourselves. I took a class at Seattle University on, uh, it was actually titled Women in the Torah, and we looked at the, the Torah, the first five chapters, and one of the things that really was fascinating about that in the book that the teacher brought up is, if you notice, God changes his contracts with humans, he changes his names as kind of a ceremonial ritual to acknowledge that God has changed, and mm -hmm. the person, Abraham, went to Abram. You know, everybody kind of has their names changed and the way that God interacts with humans, it changes. And one of the things that the teacher pointed out is God is also growing. As humans grow, God grows. Yeah. See, I think that any human being who's struggling is, it's just that part of God that's still struggling. Hmm. Right. I, I totally agree. Yeah, I... I Humans get us so much in trouble when we separate ourselves from the rest of nature and the rest of all the animals and the rest of everything else. You know, if we can just accept that we're part of the whole, that we are part of the whole fabric of everything, it makes life so much easier because then you don't have to, you know, pretend to be different and everything like that. Uh, I think that human beings, especially one beef I have with conservative religion, is there's too much this idea of God being perfect and human beings being flawed. <laughs> you know, I think it's just, that's an example of very immature thinking. Mm -hmm. And if you can just expand to realize, okay, we're all in this process of evolution, and any of us can go to the full expansion, and we can go to the full contraction at any time. Mm -hmm. That's why it's a good idea to keep an open-hearted loving attitude toward yourself and the rest of humanity all the time anyway. What an excellent point you brought up earlier about being expanded and that that expansion or that happiness is our ability to experience any emotion and be open to it. And I've worked with so many people and even in myself, you know, there's this sense of Oh, oh, I don't like that feeling. I better close up. I better hide away. I better not tell you I'm feeling that way. I better not tell myself I'm feeling that way. And okay. the reason why I love this work, Gay, is because we watch people open up and then we open up. Buddha mm -hmm. said, you know, no one is enlightened until everyone is enlightened. And I have that sense that when someone has a release, there's a release in me too. Just it fascinates me though that it's so counterintuitive. Like if you're angry at someone, you want to close up, you want to yell at them, you want to just tighten up and shrivel up and then just yell at them instead of open up and say, "Whoa, I'm I'm feeling upset and I'm curious about that." And you know, as we started, I talked to you about how revolutionary it was for me to read the microscopic truth idea, and that I was 24 years old and hadn't really experienced intimacy with a woman and I got that idea and I met a woman like a week or two later after I read that book no joke and really? I remember saying to her you know we just met and I just said to her you know I'm I'm feeling curious about this feeling that I have when I'm around you and it feels really great I'd never been that completely honest like and it was amazing you know and then when issues came up I remember how fantastic it was not to blame her and say, well, you know, I don't like what you said. Instead, I'd go, when, when I heard you say that, I felt a contraction in my chest. And I yeah. just wanted to let you know that. That's all there is to it. And that's what Katie and I have been doing now for 32 years. You know, and each, each day, our relationship is just as vivid as it was in the very beginning. I feel just as much, maybe even more in love with her now than I did 32 years ago. Mm -hmm. Because every stage along the way, we just speak honestly about what's going on. And so we keep rebirthing our relationship 
all the time at higher and higher levels of positive energy. So it's a very exciting dimension. Um, and I'm glad you're moving along that direction too because, you know, at your age, too, it's fantastic because you'll be able to invent things maybe that I haven't even dreamed of yet. So that's, uh, that's one great way about how evolution proceeds, you know, because of you hear an idea and you start applying it to your life and you see it work and then it works with your clients and, you know, then they tell their friends. And mm -hmm. so that's a beautiful thing. I think that's great. And I appreciate the work you're doing. Well, I really appreciate your time. I'm, you know, really in love with your work and, and I'm looking forward to actually doing a class where I talk about the microscopic truth and really get some couples to kind of stand up, as you mentioned in your book, and look at each other and tell each other an honest truth and go back and forth and express how did that make you feel in your body and have them go back and forth. And the work that you're doing is really fantastic. Thank you so much for your time. I was really surprised that stuff came up for me when I began talking to you. And I guess the conversation just organically went there. And um, I feel a lot more open now. So thank you so much. Blessings. Well, that's great. Thank you Thank for you. sharing your... Thank my you. pleasure. Thank you for sharing that with me. Thank you so much. Blessings. Bless Blessings to you.